Well, here we go with this flipped classroom experiment. Uh, I'm going to give this lecture on the extracellular matrix. Some of it is material that we've talked about before. Some of it is new material, so hopefully we'll get on the same page and we'll be able to discuss this in class. Uh, the cell to the extracellular matrix interactions are very similar to the cell-cell contacts that we've talked about. It's going to involve junctions, in particular the junctions that we talked about last as far as anchoring junctions go. And I'm going to explain how the cell to extracellular matrix interactions come about as well as what the extracellular matrix is composed of. So I showed you these pictures. These pictures show a fibroblast cell in the upper left image that's linked together with the collagen fibrils. The collagen fibrils are part of the fibrous proteins in the extracellular matrix. They're linked together by uh, the white spaces, which are probably the proteoglycans and uh, glycosaminoglycans that are part of the extracellular matrix that we'll discuss. In the bottom right figure, you can see the fibrous proteins very easily, the cells sitting on top of the basement membrane. And it's these interactions which allow our tissues to both anchor in place as well as communicate with one another. These pictures, the scanning EM picture on the left, as well as the transmission electron micrograph on the right, once again show the linking between the cells and the extracellular matrix proteins, and the fact that cells do not sit alone. They are not just entities. They're not islands out there. There's actually material that they sit in and on and interact with. And that is actually really important for a number of diseases that we, we're going to touch on a little bit today. So the extracellular matrix, uh, your book calls it this gel-like ground substance. Uh, what is a ground substance? So think of a ground substance as things that, that, that uh, cells can sit on top of. And as I said, it's made up of primarily two different kinds of proteins. There are polysaccharides that are important, but there are also fibrous proteins, which we've already touched about. The polysaccharides are two different kinds of polysaccharides. The glycosaminoglycans, which actually has a very easy name to remember, the GAGs, and proteoglycans, and we'll talk about both of those. And then the fibrous proteins, we'll talk about different fibrous proteins, including collagen, elastin, fibronectin, laminin, which is different than the lamin intermediate filaments, and you'll see that these fibrous proteins provide structure and also some adhesive functions for the cells. All right, so let's start with the GAGs uh, that are part of the extracellular matrix. These are sugar molecules. The sugar molecules that are linked together are linked together with an amino acid. So that's why they're called glycosoaminoglycans. So one is an amino sugar. If you look at the figure that's shown below, right, we see that there's this repeating sequence of disaccharides. And right, you won't need to know the names of these repeating disaccharides, iduronic acid and N-acetylglucose galactosamine for sulfate, that's even hard to say. But what I'd like you to recognize of this repeating structure is that there's a significant negative charge to these sugars. Notice that on each sugar it has a negative charge, either through a sulfate or through a carboxyl group. Those negative sugars make this the most anionic molecule in all of animal cells. And what's important about anionic cells? What's important about negative charges? Well, negative charges recruit positive charges, and positive charges, is when we start adding up positive and negative charges, we have a lot of ions around. And so when the, the gags sit out in the extracellular matrix, they attract these positive ions that are floating around. So we have a lot of sodium in our body. The sodium is attracted to the negative charge. And once you start attracting ions, then you start attracting water. And water is absolutely critical for the function of the extracellular matrix. Your extracellular matrix is there and it provides a cushion for your cells. It provides a cushion for your joints. It provides this, this what we call turgor pressure that swells the, the material between cells and between your between your bones, right? And so we talk about this as providing protection against compressive forces. All day long, every day, your body is impinged upon by 
gravity, right? So gravity is just jamming us down, jamming us down, jamming us down. And it's the turgor pressure that keeps our bones from rubbing bone on bone. Bone on bone hurts, all right? And with age, what do you think happens, all right? We start losing the ability to make these glycosaminoglycans. We lose the ability to make the fibrous proteins that we're going to talk about. And in old age, people actually have significant uh, pain in their joints. And part of that joint pain is because they don't have very much extracellular matrix to, to resist those compressive forces and you have bone on bone pressure. Um, the gags that are part of uh, animal cells, there's several of them. They're called, they're listed on this slide, hyaluron, dermatin or chondroitin sulfate, heparin sulfate, keratin sulfate. Notice these are sulfated molecules, so the sulfate is going to add the negative charge. But you've probably heard of some of these, chondroitin sulfate. These are now available as supplements that you can take to help aid in uh, protecting your body from these compressive forces, right? You can buy chondroitin sulfate and hopefully it's going to help your body to to keep your extracellular matrix filled with turgor pressure, all right? One of the most interesting things, right, chitin and cellulose are some of the most abundant polymers, biopolymers on earth, right? And these are also biopolymers, all of these gags because they're they're sugars with amino acids, okay? So let's talk about the, the functions of these GAGs and the proteoglycan protein. So what's a proteoglycan? It's just a protein that has some sugars on it. Uh, there's probably actually a definition for this, but I don't know what the exact number of, of sugars that needs to be on a protein for it to be called a proteoglycan. But there's a lot of functions for this extracellular matrix material. One of them that you can think about is the ability to uh, immobilize molecules that are secreted out of cells, right? So you have a lot of cells that are sitting in tissues and they're, they're making proteins, they're making uh, sugars, they're making molecules that are going to be made in the exocytic pathway and secreted out of the cells. And what happens is some of these products can get out of the tissues and make it to the bloodstream and go to other places, but some of them are going to sit in that tissue because they're bound to the extracellular matrix. So it actually creates what we call as a reservoir of proteins that can be used later. It also creates sometimes a gradient of molecules because closer to where it's secreted, you're going to have more of those molecules present than the ones that get further away. And you'll see if you take immunology, that's really important for the process of recruiting blood cells to the site of tissue damage or uh, an infection. Um, some of these proteins bind to proteins on cells and they can block their activity. And what would you need to do to change that? You'd have to change the binding in some way, cause there to be degradation of extracellular matrix. And all of this, right, is going to help us regulate the function of cells. So anything that interacts with cells binds to proteins, right? Interacts and, and could possibly inhibit the binding of other molecules is going to be important for regulating activity. So this is a, a short movie that's talking about an inflammatory response. And what they've done is they've taken a, a fish fin. And in this picture, okay, the edge of the fish fin is visible. And what they've done is they poked it with a needle. And when they've poked it with a needle, what it does is it causes an inflammatory response to occur. Cells that are underneath that, that, that uh, cell membrane will interact and then recruit blood blood cells and at the bottom of the screen what you're going to see is the blood flow and the cells that are recruited by the presence of molecules that are bound to the extracellular matrix. So I'm going to switch now to put on that video. To visualize lymphocyte homing to a site of injury, a zebrafish larva was anesthetized and its fin pierced with a needle to introduce a small wound. A vein is seen at the bottom of the frame. Because the fin is very thin and transparent, we can watch directly as lymphocytes crawl out of the blood vessel and migrate towards the wound. They are attracted there by chemicals released from damaged cells, invading bacteria, and other lymphocytes. In a zoomed out view, we can appreciate that lymphocyte invasion is restricted to the wounded area.
The static cells that are dispersed in the connective tissue are fibroblasts. In these movies, 60 minutes of real time are compressed into 15 seconds. Okay, so here we're back from that video. Um, and so what, what happens here is that the cells that are directly under this wound will recognize the damage, secrete molecules, chemicals, cytokines, chemokines, and it creates a gradient that sits in that extracellular matrix material that then allows for the recruitment of the molecules from the bloodstream. It's a very dynamic process that we can watch in, in real time relatively. Okay, so that's, that's the um, sort of sugar part of the extracellular matrix, this ground substance. The other part of the extracellular matrix that we've already talked a little bit about are the fibrous proteins. And, and the ones that I showed you early on were these collagen fibrils that are, are part of this uh, perpendicular uh, fibrous bundles of molecules that are sitting in the tissues allowing for cells to interact with both the collagen fibrils, but also with the uh, ground substance material that's surrounding them as well. And some of the fibrous proteins that we'll talk about are collagen, elastin, and fibronectin. Collagen is this really cool molecule, all right? Collagen, you know, I don't know if you guys know about some of the people that have used collagen to pump up their lips, to make really fat lips. This is a very strong substance. It, 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 it fills space very well. And it's it's a very strong molecule because of its chemical composition. All right? We're talking about proteins, and the proteins that are part of this collagen molecule are actually modified amino they have a modified amino acids in them. And the modified amino acids that they have are modified from proline and lysine. And these are hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine. And you can imagine, okay, what's important about hydroxyl groups? Hydroxyl groups are very reactive. And those hydroxyl groups actually allow for interchain and intrachain interactions. So this image is showing you on the left that the collagen chain is a it's actually made up of three alpha helices that are wound around one another and that each one contains a glycine and an XX. Okay, so the GXX sequence allows for us to have glycine and then those modified amino acids next to each other. The glycine is just small, right, taking up very little space, and the hydroxyproline and hy hydroxylysine are going to allow for intra-chain bonding. Right? So you have in panel A is just one of these, but then in panel B they're showing you three different helices that are wound around each other. Uh, so this is like taking string and making rope out of it. The stronger it is, the stronger the links between them, right, it's going to prevent stretching and prevent tearing. So collagen is this really, really strong material. It's important for skin, it's important for bones, right? It's, it's one of the materials that allows us to have uh, a very structured uh, tissue, right? So if we look at these these bonds between, and it's not just between the alpha helices, they're, they're intrahelices, right? And so in this figure in the top, I hope what you can see is, let's just start on the top right, you can see that even between the three helices, you can get helice to helice bind, bonding right from one to the other but you can also have one helix will bind to another helix and what they're showing you in panel B is what this does okay so it causes this sort of striated appearance for the collagen fibrils and that's because of the bonding from one to the other. The hydroxyproline and hy hydroxylysine are just uh, the same exact amino acids that we looked at before with one simple substitution you have a hydroxyl group added to the to the proline molecule um, at the I think that's one two three the three carbon position or you have a hydroxyl group added to the uh, middle CH2 group in the chain for lysine Alright, so these covalent crosslinks, that these are covalent bonds, and that's what really makes it strong is that it's not just this non-covalent interactions, it's covalently linked to one another, right? Gives these high high strength bonds. Right? One of the places that you might know 
of where we have problems with this is in the uh, disease called scurvy. Do you know who had scurvy? Scurvy was a disease that was associated with people that were out on the oceans for a long time. So sailors that were on the ocean didn't get enough vitamin C. And the vitamin C is an important co-molecule that's important for making these modified amino acids. You can't make hydroxyproline, you can't make hydroxylysine unless you have enough vitamin C. And so that's why, right, the British, right, they started calling their, their sailors limeys because they used to send them out with a ton of limes on the boat. And the purpose of the limes was to make sure that these sailors didn't get scurvy. Scurvy causes all sorts of problems. Um, one of the things that you might uh, know about this is that it causes teeth to fall out. And the reason for that is the connective tissue in your teeth requires these covalently cross-linked helices. So we talk about uh, collagen and and these fibrous molecules they're really important for resisting tensile forces tensile is pulling right so think of it as tug of rope um, but right the tugging of rope in your mouth is really holding the the teeth the roots in there it's holding them taut and once you loosen that up and you no longer have those strong interactions the teeth can fall out so this has practical applications right that's why we all need to get enough vitamin C in our diet Another one of the extracellular matrix proteins that's really important is elastin. And elastin, just like its name, all right, it's going to provide uh, protection against tensile forces, but it's going to also have some give. And there's a lot, a lot of tissues in your body that require give. Your blood vessels require give. Your heart requires give. And this give that I'm talking about is allowing these molecules, these elastin molecules that are fibrous molecules to to expand and contract and expand and contract. And one interesting thing about elastin, it's a highly hydrophobic molecule that is similarly cross-linked. It has similar modified amino acids to the modified amino acids in collagen. And if you look at these images, so the top image is actually a cross-section of an aorta and all of the material that's on the outside there is allow that's the elastin that's going to allow for the aorta to get bigger and smaller and on the bottom is sheets of elastin that are important for um, tissues to be able to move like your bladder gets bigger when you eat right I mean when you drink all right and so this image is showing you the cross links between the elastin molecules you don't have cross links in the molecule itself. So one elastin molecule to another will cross-link, but you don't have intra-chain. There's no extra chains in this. And, and uh, it's interesting that elastin is covered with another molecule called fibrillin. And this has been linked to diseases such as Marfan syndrome. Marfan syndrome is a disease where people exhibit um, they're actually usually quite tall. They have a huge wingspan, meaning that when they extend their arms out, they're way longer than they should be. They have long, skinny fingers. Um, and unfortunately for these people, they have defects in their ability of their elastin to function properly. Um, one of the most famous people to have this disease was Flo Hyman. She was an Olympic uh, athlete. I think she played for UCLA. She was a volleyball player. And she actually died um, playing volleyball. She was on the court. Uh, taken out of the game, sitting on the sidelines, and she fell over. She died because her aorta ruptured. And uh, you don't really live very long when your aorta ruptures. And it's the Marfan syndrome is associated with a defect in the fibrillin. The fibrillin covers the elastic fibers, the elastin, all right, that allows for this stretching. So defects in fibrillin cause this devastating disease. Marfan syndrome is, as it says, a syndrome. It is something that is usually genetic, what we call autosomal dominance, so usually one parent has it and passes it on to their child. It's characterized by three particular organ systems. There's disease of the eye, specifically lens dislocation. People with Marfan syndrome have skeletal abnormalities. Now, it is a misconception. All tall, thin people don't have Marfan syndrome. And all Marfan syndrome people are not necessarily tall. 
But it is true that many Marfan syndrome people are very thin and have certain skeletal anomalies. They have long fingers. They have a long wingspan. That is, if, you if their arms go out, their wingspan is higher, is larger than their height. They have certain things. For example, there's something called a wrist sign, where basically, if you take your thumb and your pinky, it will overlap. There's something called a thumb sign, where the thumb in a person with Marfan syndrome will actually go beyond the palm. And there's a whole host of other things. They have high arch palates. As far as the heart disease, which is the one that's probably the most important, is they do have often a form of mitral valve prolapse. But more importantly, they develop over time a dilatation of the aorta. This is because Marfan syndrome is a form of connective tissue disease. And their aortas tend to dilate and dilate and dilate. And as young adults or teenagers, they can develop life-threatening problems like aortic aneurysms. So the diagnosis is important because there is a belief now amongst cardiologists that some of the sequelae, i.e. the death from heart disease, may be able to be prevented with medication. So it is important to make that diagnosis. Okay, another molecule really important in the extracellular matrix is fibronectin. And fibronectin is this totally cool fibrous protein that has multiple different functions. Uh, in this image, in panel B, what you see is a molecule of fibronectin. It's got a, it's linked, right, one fibronectin to another through a disulfide bridge. And then each of the different colors denotes a different function in that protein. So there's domains within the protein that allow for association with itself. So you have association between fibronectin with fibronectin. You have the ability of fibronectin to bind to collagen, another extracellular matrix protein. Uh, fibronectin will bind to a particular sequence in cells, which I'll discuss in just one minute. And then it can also bind heparin. And I hope you can remember from a couple slides ago, heparin, heparin sulfate is another molecule. It's another one of the sugars part of your uh, extracellular matrix proteins. So this has multiple binding domains that allows for the fibronectin molecule to attach to cells, to attach to extracellular matrix, to attach to itself. And one of the interesting things is that uh, the cell binding domain that's part of this has an RGD sequence in it. And what do you think RGD stands for? RGD is an amino acid sequence. So R is arginine, G is glycine, D is aspartic acid. This particular sequence of amino acids is really important in a whole class of molecules that have RGD sequences in them. No matter what, What's really interesting here is that this fibronectin molecule has the ability to bind to proteins through this RGD sequence, to proteins on the cell surface through the RGD sequence. Um, an interesting thing about this RGD sequence is that the RGD sequence binds to proteins that are part of anchoring junctions. They bind to integrins. Okay, and we talked about a little bit about integrins uh, when we talked about anchoring junctions. Integrins sit, right, they have a transmembrane domain and they then allow for interaction with the extracellular matrix. One of those interactions is to fibronectin. Now, an interesting thing about fibronectin that you may know or may have heard of before is that fibronectin Right, may be associated with fibrinogen. And what is fibrinogen? So fibrinogen is an important molecule for blood clotting. Right? So part of our, our uh, immune response, and it's actually not considered part of our immune response, part of our uh, ability to regulate ourselves is the ability to heal ourselves. So if you get a cut, uh, there is a cascade of proteins that get proteolized, so they get chopped up, and one of them is fibrinogen. And fibrinogen gets chopped up and makes a blood clot. Right? And so these molecules bind to one another, basically stack on each other, and, and bind to, together in the bloodstream to stop the flow of blood out of a blood vessel. Interestingly, right, these can be targeted by snake venom. Okay, several different snake venoms, all right, including um, uh, 
uh, rattlesnakes, copperhead snakes, cause people to start bleeding sort of all over the place. All right, it's almost like a hemorrhagic fever virus, but in this case, it's really just a toxin that's causing the breakdown of fibrinogen and these fibrin clots. And so why would this matter, right? Fibronectin is the extracellular matrix molecule that allows for all right, so that you have a cell that's bound to the extracellular matrix, the fibronectin, and then you have the fibrinogen pounding on top of that. And what happens is you start breaking this whole thing down, and it breaks the blood vessels apart. So, right, this is just showing you a picture of fibrinogens that get catalyzed to be broken down. And as they're broken down, okay, right, and the catalyst is thrombin. I don't know if many of you know this, but all right, so these fibrin fibrils will create the clot and the toxin that these uh, snakes have actually break this down and they s do that based on the RGD sequence that's in these molecules. And I think that's about it for the uh, extracellular matrix. Uh, I hope that this lecture uh, can provide you with the information you need as far as what's outside of cells that the cells interact with. They interact with one another. They interact with the extracellular matrix. Right. They're going to have uh, junctions from cell to cell. They're going to have these junctions between the cell and the extracellular matrix. And all of that's going to keep our cells in the right place and provide for the functions that recruit other molecules to the proper area. I uh, am providing the next video for you just to, to give you a little bit of information about snake venom. It's an interesting little video that talks about this guy that was interested in, in looking at snake venoms and how snake venoms can be used as therapeutic uh, agents. So I thought you would enjoy that. In retrospect, hardly anyone could have imagined measuring the resistance of a wood rat to snake venom would turn out to be such an incredible scientific discovery. But it was, as Dr. John Perez, an assistant professor then, began the long quest to research links between the properties of the venom and their potential to cure human disease. Uh, I didn't believe him. <laughs> and so when we tested that wood rat, uh, it was 141 times more resistant than white mice. So we started calling that the super mouse or super rat. And this was a major discovery. You know, we were the first to report this. And th this changed my whole career. Perez, son of a Spanish immigrant, found snake venom to be an astoundingly indefatigable army of molecules which offered promise. And uh, then as we started studying the venom, we thought, oh my gosh, the venom is more interesting than the rat because there's so many different molecules in there. And... Uh, that could have potential in medicine for strokes, cancer, and heart attacks. But continuing research for the treatment of cancers, strokes, and heart attacks requires commitment and support. So that's already a fibrin clot that you're doing and you're using the venom to dissolve it? Yes, okay. correct. The NTRC, considered one of the most advanced investigative venom research sites in the world, benefits from its close alliance with biomedical education at A&M Kingsville. Bettis has been able to draw upon a dedicated base of professors and, just as importantly, students. One of them is Esteban Cantu, who explains okay, so here a test in which human what, blood coagulation uh, reacts to a venom component. Once, uh, once the sample is added, you can close it and you can start the test in which the, the plasma starts to react normally and what happens is that the coagulation process begins and this machine starts to measure the resistance it feels as a signal. The signal is then interpolated into this graph, which can then be used to determine the, how the venom affects the coagulation process. The new NTRC building, which opened last year, is better known as the Viper Center. It houses 450 snakes and 25 different species. And that simple math lies extraordinary potential to save lives. We certainly have molecules that prevent clot formation. Uh, but just because we can do it in vitro and because we can do it in mice does not mean that it's going to work in you. Completely defining the venom, well, that's what we're about. We're uh, about trying to define this venom to determine what useful molecules are. And that will probably take the rest of my lifetime and beyond just to help define the venom.